good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being there on day five. Uh, we're going to have a very exciting day where, yeah, Honey and myself, we wanted to just say hi to both of you and to welcome you. Honey, do you want to say a couple of things? Hello, everyone. Welcome to day five. Uh, we made it through the week. And uh, today is the last day of the official five day event. Of course, there will be um, working group and task force meetings next week, but officially today will be the last day. Great. So it's not because it's going to be the last day that it should be a sad day. The opposite. Today we are going to dive into the technical work done by the working groups and the task task forces of the Alliance. And I would like to start this session uh, with some of the hot of the press uh, that we have uh, produced this year, the past few months, even the past few weeks, and give you a chance to learn very quickly about them. So let's start with the um, uh, community child uh, protection reflected guideline online series with Michelle. Hi, thank you. Um, so we're actually just going to show you a video to tell you a bit more about our reflective field guide produced by the Community Level Child Protection Task Force. So if we can launch this hmm? video now, that'd be great. I didn't know. Was it? <clears throat> Sorry, one moment. Up to now, We've been discussing the new Minimum Standard 17, community-level child protection approaches and reflecting on how we can engage better with communities as individuals and organizations. Now, it's time to ask ourselves, can more community-driven approaches be used in humanitarian settings? This answer is yes but we need to do so with care. The Reflective Field Guide, Community-Level Approaches to Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, is a new resource that has been developed to share the latest learnings around community-level approaches. It is targeted at all actors supporting CP responses in humanitarian action, in particular, those who work directly with communities. It invites us to reflect on the effectiveness and sustainability of our current level of engagement with communities and to consider ways to reach higher levels of community engagement and ownership in humanitarian settings. The Reflective Field Guide has five main parts. Part one, learning and promising practices for community-level child protection approaches describes the latest learning, research, and evidence on effective engagement with communities. Part 2. Understanding your current community-level approach to child protection introduces different types of engagement with communities which will help us to reflect on the effectiveness and sustainability of our current level of community engagement. Part 3. Key considerations. Outline the critical elements needed for effective community-level child protection. Part 4. Guidance Notes. Offers ways to reach higher levels of community engagement and ownership and suggests approaches to measure this different way of working. Finally, part five, terminology and key resources provides additional explanations and links to external resources. Let's go back to Nina's camp. 
you could use the Reflective Field Guide to prepare for your work with the community members you met while finding out about the context and existing community structures. Using the templates provided and case studies as examples, you discuss the main risks children face and how to address them together. As you work with community members and children, you can use the Reflective Field Guide throughout all phases of programming to help you address risks to children more effectively and appropriately. By using these methods, you are able to facilitate a safe space where Nina finds the courage to share her idea. She tells you and other community members that most of the children are playing on rough ground and often injure themselves. She wonders if the group could help them to fill dangerous holes in the ground and to prevent cars from driving over the field and ruining the grass. The group likes her idea and agrees to find a solution together. You could facilitate the process by asking open questions such as, how could we make this happen for the children? Who will be responsible for what? How will we all know when we have been successful? By continuing to explore the Reflective Field Guide, its capacity building package, as well as the other resources referred to through this online learning series, we can strengthen the way we work alongside communities. And we're now going to share the link to the website. There's a resource hub that has all of the materials that were produced um, along with the Reflective Field Guide. Um, so you can access that through the Alliance webpage under the Initiatives tab. I've also just shared the link in the chat. Um, and if you join us for the next session with pitches for the Marketplace um, Task Force and Working Groups, you'll also get to learn a little bit more about the other resources produced under this project. We hope to see you there. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, we are looking forward to see what's going to happen with Nina, the new friend of Hannah. Um, and uh, with no further delay, I'm going to um, now introduce uh, Aldild, who from the Advocacy Working Group, who will give us a little bit of a teaser regarding uh, the next upcoming report. Aldil, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, I'm Alvil and I'm one of the co-leads of the Advocacy Working Group. We've been working a lot lately on a report that shows how much or how little uh, funding goes to child protection within humanitarian uh, responses. And the same was done last year. So what we've done now is to update the numbers and also look a little bit at how uh, this whole COVID response has affected uh, child protection and funding for child protection. So there are different focuses in the report. We look at the uh, country HRPs, and we also look at the uh, refugee responses, as well as now the, the response so far with the COVID. And I will just give you a small snapshot uh, of what we have found. And this is based on digging into 17 different HRPs for 17 different countries in 2019. So I don't know if you see the slide, now I can get the slide up. No? Uh, just one second, we're just getting it up for you. You want, you, uh, yeah, I can, that. sorry, I thought you meant you were doing it. So based on, based on these, uh, on these, um, uh, based on uh, these 17 different HRPs, there are 28 million children uh, in need of protection services, and that's in 2018. So now let's imagine these are 28 million children. And these are children that we have identified are in need of child protection services. And it's much probably higher. And don't change the slide until I just wait, uh, Jessica. 
so uh, <clears throat> this number is probably higher because we, we don't always have the capacity to do the needs assessment that are needed. So now the next one, Jessica. So if we look at these 28 million uh, children that we know are in need of child protection services, and this include caregivers as well, for different reasons, um, because we have limited access or because we have limited resources or because we think if we ask for too much, maybe we won't get anything. Uh, we only target about one third of the children that we know are in need. And in some contexts, like in the Central African Republic, we only target 4%. And in a country like DRC, it's only eight. So next slide, Jessica. Yes, and because, so when we look at these specific uh, eight, uh, 17 HRPs, we only receive about 38% of the, of the funds we, we ask for. And so let's assume that we reach a, a proportional number of children. So these are the children that are left. So it's 13% of those children that we originally identified as being in need of some kind of child protection services uh, and their caregivers. So it's like roughly 3.6 million children out of 28 million children. And in 13 of these 17 countries, we only spent about $20 per child. And then while we look at money, or while we talk about money, I can get the next slide. So this is uh, the overall humanitarian response appeal. So this is for the 17 countries, all the humanitarian funding that we ask for as a humanitarian community. <clears throat> And then the next one. And then oh, I don't know if you can see in the corner there, there is two dollars that are highlighted. This is what we ask for for protection, for child protection. So two dollars out of a hundred, two percent. Next one. For different reasons, we only receive uh, about 76 cents out of the $2 that we ask for to do the work. And as already, as we've already seen, we're already, we're only targeting about one third of the children that we know are in need. So in this report, what is it that we want? <clears throat> the next slide. We say that it's not enough. We need child protection to be fully funded or at least at the level of other sectors. We also need to, to ask for what it takes to pay for what we need to do. So based on needs, and we need to have the, the goal of reaching the child protection minimum standards in, our, in the response. And another thing is that we have to insist on protecting all children and also in, the, in those uh, contexts which are, which are being very low low uh, funded. So what I've talked about here uh, is, uh, is just one of the findings and there is, there is more in the report and it's being launched on the 27th of October. So then you will all be welcome to, to join the, the, the webinar launch. For example, if you take uh, the refugee responses into consideration along with the 17 countries, it looks a little bit better. So the child protection is funded at 70, as 47%, but it's still low compared to the other humanitarian sectors, which is at uh, 67. And there is great uh, disparities between the different responses. Some are only covered at 35%, but uh, others are only are uh, covered at 94. So there is big differences. So what I can say is like, stay tuned for the 27th and uh, that we hope that this report can be useful uh, to, the, to the sector and to increase the focus and the capacity to do needs assessments and also the funding for, for child protection. Thank you so much. Great, thank you Alvid for that. And I can see already some discussion in the chat box. So we are very much looking forward uh, for the release of the report. And obviously we will keep you informed about it uh, on the Alliance. Um, so now I'm very pleased to move 
to um, the MOOC, Protection of Children and COVID-19. Uh, I speak in French, it's Friday, sorry for that, uh, with Elena from the LMD Working Group, Learning and Development. Elena, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to day five of the annual meeting. So my name is Elena Giannini, the LMD um, co-lead of the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance. Um, I just would like you all to take a deep breath for a second and think perhaps of your current employment as a child protection practitioner, or perhaps imagine to be back at one of those um, field locations that you have uh, uh, worked in uh, during your professional life. So just really settle yourself in that uh, framework. And now, COVID-19 hits and a lot of what we know changes and we have to adapt and navigate through uncertainty. To help with this new normal, the Alliance and other organizations developed lots of resources, tools, webinars, which is great because it has shown the agility of the sector, to put it in uh, Cornelius' words that were used earlier in the week. Said so that you are struggling with competing priorities, you don't know which documents are more relevant to your COVID-19 landscape. You probably have additional pressure as you have to take care of your children because they're not going to school because you also have been impacted by COVID-19. Or if you don't have children, maybe other dear ones, or you just trying to figure out how to live like through COVID-19. So no panic with some delay uh, because it's a last second release, not a last week release, uh, as uh, Audrey was pointing out, literally being worked on till last night. Uh, the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course on Protecting Children During COVID-19, I think can actually help. Uh, it's a six weeks online course that uh, structured or systematizes some of the resources that have been developed by the Alliance. Like they can truly help um, practitioners navigate those resources and maybe understand, we understand which ones are the most relevant like in their context. It's simple to navigate and quick. So I'll just share my screen and I open my connection all because I had some last minute e-caps with this. And I hope you all see a page with uh, end washing going on. Can I have a thumbs up for that, that you can actually see it? Excellent. Uh, so this is actually the advertisement page like of the course. So feel free to direct your colleagues to register on the, on the course right now because the registrations are open. And uh, the course will actually start on the 26th of October. You have like all the information for who the course is to, practically anyone working on child protection in humanitarian settings or development settings, as well as social service workforce more at large. And um, yeah. And all the information here together with our wonderful host and our donors that have made this possible. So just because you're here with us today, I'll be able to show you a sneak peek on how you navigate through the course. You won't be able to see the part I'm going to show now uh, without having registered on the course. But I want to give you a flavor of how simple and easy it is to navigate through the course. So let's take a sample from week one because I don't want to give away too much of the course itself. So you can see that the course is divided actually in weeks, six weeks worth of content, and every week is divided in activity and every activity into steps. So if we take uh, the first week, you have a welcome article from uh, that introduces, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to see this. <laughs> you have a welcome article uh, with all the information around the, the structure of the MOOC itself and 
once you actually scroll to the bottom and then you, you have completed this step, uh, when you are a learner on the program, you can mark as complete. And then you can move on to the next step. There are article steps, there are video steps, there are quizzes, uh, there are also peer-to-peer -peer review exercises. And it's a very social platform where you get to exchange with a lot of other colleagues, learn from each other. and um, Facilitate, facilitate the process of uh, capacity building through exchange with other colleagues. Um, so I really think that this uh, product can actually help many uh, navigate like through all the resources on COVID-19 and adapt programming. Uh, and if you have any question, feel free to reach us at the uh, learning at alliancepha.org uh, email address that I'm sure Anita has typed in the chat box. Um, and do register on the course, please. Thank you very much. And on to you, Audrey. Great, thank you. Um, and I can see Sam again in the chat box uh, that people are quite interested in that opportunity. And I think it's a very timely opportunity. We've been talking about capacity building, remote capacity building since the beginning of the week. Um, and here we are with a good opportunity to have access to more knowledge when it comes to child protection and COVID-19. So yes, people, please enroll, register and share the link. And I will now, on this, move on to the competency framework with Anita from the Learning and Development Working Group as well. Um, so we are still uh, very much um, in learning processes and capacity building and, and expertise. So uh, Anita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Um, can I please have my slides? Thank you. Okay, so the next presentation is uh, another uh, is about another product for the uh, learning from the learning and development working group. I'm Anita. I'm the other uh, co-lead of the learning and development working group. So uh, Ellen and I co-lead together the learning and development working group. So sorry, just to understand, can I move it or do I need to say next every time? Okay. You're gonna have to. Yes, you need to say next. Okay, perfect. Um, anyway, so this is the product. So this is the um, uh, final child protection humanitarian action competency framework. Next, please. Just for you to know, uh, this is not a new competency framework. It's rather a revised version of the 2010 competency framework, which was developed by the former child protection working group. What happened is that uh, in 2018, the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance uh, um, began uh, revising the first uh, competency framework. The revision process was uh, informed by uh, a desk review, uh, a survey, and key informal interviews with several uh, practitioners across regions. Then in 2019, a field testing version of the framework was made available. And in 2020, we have made further adjustment to the framework in order to integrate feedback received by all practitioners um, across the regions, by the uh, leads of working group and task forces, and also to make sure that the uh, framework was uh, fully aligned with the 2019 edition of the CPMS. Okay, so as you can see, it's a, a long process. Now, what's the purpose of the competency framework? The competency framework uh, um, set uh, the competency framework. Sorry, the competency framework. Sorry, articulates uh, um, recognized uh, technical competencies for uh, child protection humanitarian action, and most importantly, describe uh, uh, what are uh, expected standards of performance across all the competencies. It is. <laughs> Uh, primarily for use by uh, child protection practitioners in humanitarian settings, and it can be used by practitioner at entry, mid and senior level. Um, it could also be used by their manager and by HR staff. Um, it has three areas of application. So number one, recruitment, why the competency framework can be used uh, um, 
for recruitment because uh, um, it provides uh, key indicators for uh, uh, behavior, skills, uh, knowledge, and attitudes uh, which are required for various roles related to um, child protection humanitarian action. It can also facilitate uh, learning and development. Um, why? Because as I said before, the competency framework sets uh, benchmarks. And by doing so, it allows us to um, define uh, the gap between expected and current levels of performance, which in turn will help us to define the areas on which we might need further support. And lastly, the competency framework can be used for performance management. As I said before, it sets some benchmark and therefore um, it can be used as a basis for self-assessment, but also for uh, um, more formal performance appraisal. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the structure of the competency framework. Sorry, it's a bit small. But anyway, uh, what I would like to um, highlight is that the competency framework is uh, composed of uh, technical competencies, the green one, core values, the blue one, and uh, um, core humanitarian competencies, the, um, the violet one. Um, Next slide, please. We are going to focus now uh, specifically on the technical competencies. So as you can see on the left, you will see you, see, you can see all the technical competencies that are covered by the competency framework. And on the right, you can see the um, technical competency domains. So the technical competencies are organized per domain. And as you can see, the domains are structured around the principles and the four pillars of the CPMS. So let's, for example, pick one. No, sorry. Let's, for example, pick one. So as you can see, we have a competency domain, which is titled uh, Developing Adequate Child Protection Strategy. Strategies. And then if you look at the competencies within that domain, you will see um, competencies such as uh, developing community level approaches, developing strategies for case management, developing strategies for alternative care and so forth. Okay, next slide, please. Right, so um, behavioral indicators are listed for each competency. Um, I've selected one of the competencies, which is about developing strategies for case management. Behavioral indicators uh, basically show you what uh, effective uh, um, performance looks like. So they tell you what you need to demonstrate to, um, so what you need to, um, to show to demonstrate that uh, you have that competency at that level. As you can see, indeed, behavioral indicators uh, are there for three different levels. You have a level one, level two, and level three. Level one uh, describes uh, individuals uh, who are rather new to the competency. Maybe you can have, uh, uh, maybe you can take a few seconds to read one indicator. Um, level two describes individuals who have uh, some experience with the competency. Um, maybe gain from a few assignments across uh, um, different uh, humanitarian settings. And then you have uh, level three, which uh, uh, describes individual uh, who are uh, who fully master the competency and who are even able to build the capacity of other on that competency. Now, it is expected that uh, um, with experience and with career progression, practitioner will move from level one to level two and eventually to level three. But of course, this is true only for the competencies that are relevant to um, uh, our job, our role. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more about uh, the competency framework, please get in touch with the Learning and Development Working Group or join us today during the Learning and Development Working Group session. I think it's at 4, 10 p.m. Central European time. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, Anita. And again, I can see some discussion in the chat box. I think people are very much interested in all those new resources that are presented so far, um, and mainly as well about when they could get access to the competency framework, etc. So I think they will have some of the answers during the marketplace. So thank you so much, Anita. And I'm very pleased to move on to um, Interagency on Uncompanied and Separated Children Toolkit presentation with Annalisa and Julia from the Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force. Ladies. Thank you. Can we put Julia on as well? And also, could we have our slides, please? get the slides okay i'll start in the meantime so um thank you so much for this space good morning good afternoon good evening everybody um so the next presentation is a presentation on behalf of the unaccompanied and separated children task force um i'm annalisa and i'm the co-lead of that task force from the irc thank you if we could go to the next slide um, so just quickly, um, the Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force provides technical material and support to guide policy development, as well as programming, which addresses the cases of family separation. So the purpose is to enhance the protection of unaccompanied and separated children in situations of crisis, conflict and natural disasters, and as well as to harmonize and strengthen um, the case management response for unaccompanied and separated children. So the latest um, resources that we've been working on as a group um, has been the handbook and the toolkit for unaccompanied and separated children. Um, this uh, provides material support and support to guide both policy development as well as programming in addressing um, cases of family separation with the aim of enhancing the protection of unaccompanied children in humanitarian settings. Both the handbook and the toolkit um, complement the interagency guiding principles for unaccompanied and separated children, which came out in 2004, so many years ago, um, with um, more programmatic approaches as well as tools to provide a compre comprehensive um, operational guidance for child protection practitioners, as well as other actors that are working um, to both prevent on the one hand, as well as respond uh, to family separation and emergencies. So it includes um, references to key international instruments, um, guidelines relating to unaccompanied and separated children and how to work with them, as well as sample tools and templates to use in programming. Um, next slide, please, and I'll hand over to Julia. Thank you, Annalisa. Next slide, please, about the dissemination. So in terms of the dissemination of the content of the two publications, the Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force developed a training of trainers, so a TOT package based on the guidance and tools that are included in both the handbook and in the toolkit. So the purpose of having the training in the form of a TOT yeah. was essentially to count on a multiplying effect so that the first trained child protection practitioners could then replicate the knowledge and tools within their country operations. So IOM organized and facilitated um, the field rollout of the TOT in Ethiopia and in Niger in coordination with the child protection area of responsibility and more precisely with its respective country child protection working groups. And both times we had participants from local organizations, I and NGOs, UN agencies, as well as the government. We were also organizing two other regional rollouts in Senegal and in Tunisia, but these were unfortunately canceled um, due to COVID-19 measures. Next slide, please. In addition to the rollout of the TOT, we also engaged in the dissemination of the content of the publications in other ways. So to start with, to support field work, we also engaged in the translation of both the handbook and the toolkit into French, Spanish and Arabic. And the translations are now available uh, online through the main uh, website of the Alliance. 
Secondly, um, we are also in the process of finalizing the brief on the handbook on unaccompanied and separated children. And this basically aims at providing um, a very short summary of the key concepts included in the handbook and in the toolkit, such as the causes and consequences of family separation, mitigation measures, as well as key considerations and steps to take uh, when working with unaccompanied and separated children. And the brief will be translated as well into French, Spanish and Arabic and will be available for you online so that you can disseminate further as well. The third tool that um, we wanted to present, I cannot share my screen, um, is, okay, thank you, is the hub on unaccompanied and separated children. So as you can see here, the hub was developed thanks to the support of the Alliance Knowledge Management Team. It includes very short descriptions of what is included in both the handbook and in the toolkit, as well as access to their um, respective translations. And please, I mean, the, the link has been included in the resources library for this meeting. So please make sure you save it and you consult it as um, all the tools that will be developed in relation to the handbook and the toolkit will be included in here, such as the brief, for example. Um, and then just as a last point about what is coming next, the unaccompanied and separated children task force is planning on organizing webinars and field consultations um, to tackle some issues uh, for child protection practitioners. Uh, that you might want to learn more about or discuss further. And we will be discussing about possible topics of the webinars next week during the virtual face-to-face -face meeting on Thursday. So um, please make sure you participate and see you all there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Annalisa and Julia. And please have a look at the chat box. A lot of discussion or questions for you ladies uh, are waiting for you, so take the time. Um, it's cool, it's Friday, we have time. So now I'm happy to move to the Interagency Child Labor Toolkit with Lotte and Sylvia from the Child Labor Task Force. Ladies, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, so my colleague Lotte and myself, we work with Plan International, we'll be sharing briefly on the Child Labor Toolkit. My name is Sylvia and I co-lead the Child Labor Task Force together with Simon from ILO. Uh, so to start with, we want to get some feedback from the audience today. So we want you to use your reaction button so you can click on the reaction if you agree uh, on the thumbs up and if you don't have it, you can also use your video. So you can also do it like this uh, live. So in my context, think about your context. In my context, child labor is a problem. If you agree, please click thumbs up using the Zoom reaction or do it live with your video on. I'll give a few seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next statement, we want to get some feedback to ensure like what we are presenting today is relevant. In my context, child labor is sufficiently addressed. If you agree with this statement, please click thumbs up using Zoom reactions. You can see the Zoom reactions at the bottom of the screen. I'll give a few seconds for those that think that uh, in that context, child labor is sufficiently addressed. Thank you. So as you have seen, um, most of the participants uh, positively answer to the first question and less participants answer with yes to the second question. So this is really very, very similar to what happened three years ago when the child labor task force did a global consultation and asked these two same questions. So almost 100% of the participants responded positively to the question that child labor 
was a, a problem in their context. However, less than half of the participants uh, answered positively to the question that was sufficiently addressed. So as this, this shows like a huge discrepancy between the humanitarian needs of children and the, our response. And this was actually the starting point for the development of the child labor toolkit um, that was uh, field tested throughout these years for three years. And today we are really happy and we are very excited to share with all of you that we are launching and presenting the new interagency toolkit at preventing and responding to child labor in humanitarian action that will support child protection practitioners, development colleagues, governments and also other humanitarian practitioners. So Lotte, can you tell us what is new? You've been involved in this process since the beginning. What is new in this toolkit compared to the field tested version? Thanks, Sylvia. Um, well, firstly, this uh, version of the toolkit contains a lot of new and much more recent evidence on what works in addressing child labor in humanitarian settings. Um, this evidence comes from recent research and program evidence that has been collected by numerous agencies, including the feedback from around 100 practitioners who were part of piloting the guidance and tools over the past three years. This has resulted in 30 new and updated case studies and more than 20 practical tools for practitioners, including specific guidance for frontline workers. Um, secondly, the toolkit also has a much stronger focus now on working with adolescents and tackling the gender specific barriers for girls. Um, and third and finally, the toolkit now also outlines uh, what we should consider when we work in different humanitarian contexts, including in infectious disease outbreaks. Okay, this is great. And I'm sure like this will be very helpful for all our participants that are uh, discussing the topic of infectious disease outbreaks. What were the main learnings about child labor uh, in humanitarian settings over the past years, Lotte? Well, one thing the piloting phase really has confirmed for us is that the uh, is the importance of taking a multi-sectoral and integrated approach to addressing child labor. Um, of course, child labor is an issue that you know, squarely sits in child protection programming. Um, but we also know that without the involvement of actors who are working in education, food security and livelihoods and health, it's really impossible to tackle this issue. Um, another aspect of humanitarian action uh, is prevention. And when we look at many emergencies around the globe, um, we really see that the response to child labor often starts way too late when it's already a widespread problem. Uh, for example, today in Syria, it is estimated that more than 75% of all families rely on income from child labor. And this is actually very common in many protracted and complex crises around the world. Um, so with new sections on emergency preparedness, strategic response planning and prevention, we really hope that uh, we can make sure that child labor gets better prioritized um, before, during and after crisis. Um, and I just want to take uh, this moment also to um, for a special shout out to Alison Anon, who has really been leading this work uh, on behalf of the child labor to, uh, task force over the last three years. So thanks for Alison. Um, so Sylvia, let me ask you a question as the lead of the child labor task force. Um, when the toolkit is published, how will the Alliance roll out this new resource? Thank you, Lotte. So um, it's great to hear that uh, it's focusing on prevention and integration that has been discussed this, uh, throughout this week. Um, so the Alliance, together with the Child Labor Task Force, with Simon and myself, we are working together on a plan to ensure that like, we can roll out and we can reach all practitioners with the toolkit. The toolkit is, is going to be available in a couple of weeks on the Alliance website. Uh, and there will be an accompanying training package to support the dissemination of the toolkit. Among the different activities, we will also have a global webinar that we hope like practitioners and colleagues can join. Excellent. Um, so if the practitioners uh, wish to know a little bit more about uh, child labor, um, what can they do? So there are like few things that people can do. First, when the toolkit is available in a few weeks, uh, 
we hope they can take the time to really understand, go through the toolkit um, and also attend the webinar. Secondly, we hope they can also share, disseminate, and get in touch with the child labor uh, task force if they can so organize a training in the country or they need any support. And finally, they can join us in the child labor task force session this afternoon, starting at 5.10 Central European time, is uh, 6.10 uh, in Amman or Nairobi. And we also have next week our annual meeting. So we'll have like two hours to focus more on the priorities, including the rollout of this toolkit. Uh, that will be next week on Wednesday. We have put our contacts on the slide and uh, we hope that we can work together. So we wait for you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sylvia and Lotte. And to answer some of the questions in the, in the chat box, as Hani wrote, we will share with you some of those resources after the annual meeting. Just to remind you that some of them are already available on the Alliance website, as well as uh, under Kiko chat, uh, where we have put um, a resource library and I will share the link um, in a minute. Um, surprisingly, we are not even on time. We are ahead on schedule. so. I am very pleased now to call Hani uh, for um, a very, very hot of the press, last minute release. Uh, so please, Hani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm very glad that we are ahead of time. So we had the chance to, we didn't know if this tool is gonna be ready uh, for this meeting or not. That's why we didn't originally put it on the, on the plan. Uh, but now that we have a bit of time, I wanted to go through it quickly with you. Um, so this tool, and it actually really links well with, with what the presentation that was just done and Lota's reference to, to prevention of, um, of child labor, because we know that COVID-19, one of the major impacts that it has had um, is, is um, kind of contributing to more poverty and possibly uh, extreme poverty. And, World Bank, um, I believe a couple of days ago, released new data suggesting that 115 million uh, people are going to go into extreme poverty, making achievement of SDG 1 possibly Im impossible um, by 20, 2030. So it's, uh, it basically, that's, that's the core of this, of this document. And the reason we want to work with social protection much more systematically um, is that we know that in the next three, five years, we're going to see increase in child protection is issues, including child labor, child marriage, um, school dropouts, um, and, and many more, primarily because of the impact of, of uh, COVID-19 on, 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 uh, on the economy. Um, so we came together with several organizations spearheaded with, uh, by UNICEF and, and Save the Children to bring together this policy paper that helps practitioners like yourself advocate for more systematic integration of social protection and child protection programming. It is um, divided into three sections. Um, and the first section does an introduction of what, what we are even talking about. Uh, and it's, it frames it around the, the medium and long-term impact of COVID-19 on protection and well-being of children. Um, the second section, um, of course, it also has this really intuitive um, diagram about what child-sensitive social protection system means that puts children at the center. It talks about what child protection is, what social protection is. Um, one of the one of the strengths of, of this document is its use of evidence. We have really tried to bring in the evidence that exists on, on the impact of social protection interventions on child protection outcomes. And that, that has made it a really strong advocacy document because then you can take these evidence and, and, um, and advocate with donors internally within your organizations with your governments. Um, it makes a really strong argument of why we should leverage social protection towards child protection outcomes. There's a whole section on evidence illustrating how child, social protection actually contributes to, um, to child protection. Um, and then 
it goes to very concrete recommendations. Um, and I want to pause a little bit on this one because this is this is where I think a lot of you can spend spend a lot of uh, energy in bringing these these recommendations to life um, by taking the ones that that are relevant to your context or the to your role um, and try to use them for advocacy for better integration of social protection and um, and uh, child protection. I'm actually just going to share this link, the link to this in the chat, just to make sure everyone has it. Um, so the recommendations are divided into, I think, four or five subsections. One is on financing policy and coordination. Um, it, it talks about um, how, how, what, what elements you can bring to your government or to your donor in terms of financing and policy and coordination. Um, it talks about influencing policy and joint advocacy, um, joint planning and coordination between relevant social protection and child protection departments and coordination groups, um, and mapping and assessing policy and programs la landscape jointly to identify gaps and opportunities to embed social protection and child protection systems and responses. Uh, the second part of recommendations is on pro program design and implementation. So it becomes a bit more pragmatic and talks about how you can actually design your some of your programs to make sure that they, the, some of the social protection programs to make sure that they contribute to child protection outcomes. It has a section on monitoring and evaluation and research uh, to build evidence further on, in this area, because even though we have been able to to use a lot of existing evidence, but still the evidence is pretty um, minimal in this area of, of exactly how social protection impacts child protection outcomes. So this um, paper calls for strengthening the evidence base and a systems-wide approach to uh, integration of, of social protection and child protection. We also ask some case studies. The case studies will be further developed in the, in the next version that will come out in about two weeks, um, but this will give you a sense of what the case studies are about. I will stop there. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer in the chat, um, but hope you make use of it and be advocates for further supporting um, child protection through social protection. Thank you. Great, right. thank you so much, Hani, for this quick presentation and for sharing the link with us. And obviously I would encourage people to, um, to go and, and read it. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to say to uh, before officially hand over the next session to Hani. The first one is um, this week we have celebrated the first anniversary of the 2019 edition of the CPMS. Uh, still a little bit hot of the press. So I would remind you as well to go and uh, get still more and more familiar with that uh, fundamental resource um, of the Alliance. And uh, we have been talking about that throughout the week, but uh, meet Hannah on our website, our chat box, um, chatbot, pardon. Um, needs your question to learn more and to get better and will be there as well to provide you with answer when it comes to COVID-19 resources. So I would like to thank um, all those uh, all those ladies who have today presented uh, brilliantly uh, the new resources of the Alliance. Thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, thank you so much for being on time and even ahead of schedule. I know we've put pressure on you and you did a great job. Uh, people are very interested into uh, what you have uh, presented, so well done. And I'm very pleased now to hand over to Hani for what is coming up next. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Audrey, and all the colleagues who presented. So this almost was a snapshot of what the working groups and task forces of the Alliance have been up to. Of course, not all of them are very represented in this, in this session that, that you just uh, were a part of. Um, so then from, from now on, for the rest of the day, what we are going to be doing is we will have in chunks, in three different chunks of time, we will have between four and five of the groups, including working groups, task forces, and initiatives of the Alliance 
who will be presenting their work to you, to you all in a format that we call Marketplace. And it's based on what we do face-to-face -face when we meet, um, but we have redesigned it to match the format um, that we have uh, online now. So the first one that I have the pleasure of, um, of uh, facilitating will include the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group, Advocacy Working Group, and accompanying the Separated Children Task Force that you just heard from, um, Community Level Child Protection Task Force, which you also heard from, um, and the Localization uh, Initiative. Um, what we will do now is I'll invite each of them to provide a three minute pitch, three, sorry, I, I went for four, but it's actually three, uh, three minute pitch um, of what, what they're gonna be talking about in their group to convince you to do, go to their session because after that you're gonna be distributed into all of those individual sessions or marketplaces. Um, so they have these three minutes to convince you to go there, but also tell you um, all, the, all the most important things that they want you to know in case you're not going to their, to their session. So case, case uh, CPMS wants you to know these five things, even if you don't go to their, um, to their particular event. Of course, I know everyone wants to go to um, CPMS working group, but so without further ado, I will invite Joanna and Susanna to do the three minute pitch. And the clock is ticking. Thanks very much, Hani. No pressure. Um, so on the first anniversary of the 2019 edition, we want to invite you to come to our session uh, to explore how we can all champion the CPMS in the context of COVID-19, where more children are exposed to multiple and compounding humanitarian crises. The minimum standards are more critical now than even before, and many of the discussions this week have reflected the CPMS as the foundation of our work. In our session, we'll share updates on some of our key tools, answer your questions, and have the opportunity for you to share your ideas on how to uplift the minimum standards in COVID-19 responses and beyond. So we all know that the CPMS promote quality and accountability across all child protection responses. And they're really the key way that we operationalize the rights of children and their families. 1900 colleagues from 85 countries around the world contributed to provide us with minimum key actions, tested indicators, clear definitions and guidance on how to achieve results for children in humanitarian settings. But the CPMS are just a pretty book if they aren't put to use in all elements of our work. So we invite you to join our session to explore how we can continue to implement the CPMS together. We know from experience that humanitarian standards need to be contextualized and rolled out at the country level if they are to be applied by frontline workers. And in 2020, colleagues from Bangladesh, Syria, Western Central Africa and beyond have been doing just that. In the recent call for the CPMS Innovation Fund, more than 50 national and international organizations submitted 62 applications targeting more than 30 countries around the world. Thanks, Susanna. So we know that it's up to each of us and individual practitioners, as staff, as, as leaders within our own organizations to promote understanding and effective application of the standards. So we want you to join our session to learn about specific ways to champion the CPMS and to share your experiences. Um, we're going to highlight some great new tools that you've heard about. We'll be able to unpack them a little bit. Um, the new implementation pack to support country level rollout, the updated CPMS video series, and other forthcoming initiatives and opportunities like the CPMS e-course uh, and so on. The session will also be a chance for you to ask your questions and share your ideas on working across sectors, capacity building around the CPMS and country level rollout. Many of you are already leading uh, on work to strengthen the application of the CPMS. We don't know about it and, and we're really eager to hear from you and what your experiences have been. Each of us has a role to play in strengthening the implementation of the 2019 CPMS and about quality and accountability in our sector. And so whether you're a donor, a global advisor or a country level colleague, please join us for this session to explore how we can champion the CPMS together. I think we're on time. Fantastic. 
literally two seconds ahead of time. Well done. So this is CPMS. We encourage you to, to do your best to join their group. Uh, they will be in room one um, after the after the round of pitches. So now we we would I would like to invite Alveld uh, Strom, if I'm not pronouncing it wrongly. Alveld leads our advocacy working group. Uh, of course, we have Ritu as well, who's the co-lead, but unfortunately Ritu has not been feeling well. We wish her um, fast recovery. Um, Alveld, over to you for your pitch. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Hani. So I've already presented one of the things we, we have uh, produced or are uh, producing as it's being launched later this year. So I want to use this opportunity for you to get a uh, little bit of, a, uh, of uh, some information about other things that we've been up to as a, the advocacy working group, but mainly to ask for your inputs on what do you think we should focus on for the next uh, four years? And then, no, sorry, three years. And then also, how can we, as an advocacy group, support you or your agency or your working group or task force better moving forward? So without promising anything, we are a group of very uh, good in, like policy influencers and advocates. So we might be able to, to help you. And we will uh, take your comments into our discussion next week when we decide what to do. I'm sure that's not three minutes, but that's all I have. So back to you, honey. Earlier is always better. <laughs> Great. So uh, thanks, Alvilds, for that. So please go check uh, check out the advocacy working group work in room two after after this session. I would like to invite Annalisa. I don't know if Julia is also coming on, or is that Annalisa? Hello. No, I'll do this one. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Hani. Um, oh, hold on. Let me put my video on. I thought I had. There you go. I hope you can see me all. So thank you very much. Um, we So the um, Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force, I presented it just about half an hour ago, so I don't need to go into what we do. Um, but we're very excited to invite you to our um, breakout session in a few minutes. Um, we will be keeping in theme with the theme of the of the alliance meeting this um this week and looking at really hearing from you um on how has covid and um these last six months impacted our work or your work um on um working with unaccompanied and separate children um so really wanting to hear what have been the challenges what have been potentially some successes, some new and innovative ways of working that um, we need to learn from and document um, and um, and that we need to take into consideration as we then um, move forward. So really the next session is for us to listen. Um, we'll be breaking out into a few groups, uh, depending if we have as many of you as possible or, or staying in a smaller group if we don't, um, to, to really hear from you as the session today will inform then um, our session that Julia mentioned last week, which is the meeting of the Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force, where we'll be using the information from today to feed into how we'll be moving forward, what are some of the things that we need to focus on, what are some potential resources or other things that we need to work on. So please come, um, especially if you work um, or have worked or are intending to work with Unaccompanied and Separated Children, we'd be really, really keen to hear from you. Thank you. And that was less than three minutes. Great, fantastic. Everyone is doing so good today. Thank you. Um, yes, so go check out the yeah. Unaccompanied and Separated Children yeah. Task Force in room um, three. Sorry, it was someone trying to speak. Great, so community level uh, child protection task force, Michelle and Brikena, um, the, the co-leads of the, of the task force will tell you about their work. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle, and as Hani just mentioned, I am the co-lead of the Community Level Child Protection Task Force with Kenna from World Vision. Um, we are now going to share a Mentimeter poll in the chat with a simple yet key question for you to quickly fill out, please. So Kenna, if you can share that link. Um, and our question for you is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Have you and your organization relied on or engaged with community members more than ever before to ensure the continuation of your programming? I feel like this is a theme that has really come out over the past few days of this meeting. And so if you've answered yes, you have, have had to in interact with and engage more with communities, you should join the Community Level Child Protection Task Force's marketplace. The Community Level Child Protection Task Force seeks to strengthen the evidence base for community level child protection programming, document innovative and promising practices, and develop guidance and capacity building resources based on learning from our colleagues around the world. During our session, we will share helpful tools, guidance, and research on engaging with communities to build on their existing strengths um, and mechanisms to protect children during COVID-19 and beyond. If you are wondering what practical tools might already exist to engage communities in strengthening the protective environment for children, especially, but not only during COVID-19, or have some tools you would like to share with us, then you are welcome to join our session. Specifically, we will have four dynamic presenters who will engage you in small group discussions on the Child Protection Minimum Standard Number 17, the Reflective Field Guide, the Community Level Child Protection Task Force's guidance on engaging communities during COVID-19, and ongoing research on community engagement and case management. So if you want to learn more about these exciting resources and share your experience engaging with communities to protect children, come join us in the CCP Task Force room. Thank you. Is Kenna gonna continue or should I come in? That's it. <laughs> That's you. it, perfect. Wow, I love today's um, <laughs> really on time. Um, presentations. Great. So if you want us to um, learn more about the community level um, child protection ta task force, please go to room four after this session. Now, last but definitely not the least, least and I'm glad that we have <laughs> our sector has uh, a lot of uh, amazing and dedicated women, but now we have one man who is going to present, um, which is Riyadh. Uh, who is leading our localization work. Thank you so much. Since I was the only one, I should get like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you get, you get 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so localization, um, it came yesterday as one of the priorities. Um, and guess what? You don't need to wait for the strategic plan to be ready to start working on localization. You just can join us now and just start brainstorming on what should we do during the last, uh, during the next um, three years, maybe. Um, if you come from a local NGO, I would love to, to hear how the Alliance can support you and what kind of work you, you feel you can, you can do within the Alliance. If you come from international NGO, also we would love to, to, to hear um, how you can support the, the agenda of localization and how do you see the integration between the uh, international uh, NGOs work and the, the local organizations work. And if you are a donor, then that's the cherry on the top for me. Um, and man, oh man, we have so much to talk about if you're a donor. So please come uh, join us in the localization group and um, I would be facilitating. So you don't need to, you, you really don't want to miss that. Back to you, Hani. Fantastic. Wow, all the pitches are very convincing. Um, and I would like now to invite all of you guys to take a 10 minute break. Uh, we were meant to have the break before this, but with, we're finishing, we'll leave this room, but I really strongly suggest that you select your room. When you leave this room, go back to Kiko chat, select the room that you want to be in. So whether it's CPMS room one, or it's um, advocacy working group room two, unaccompanied separated children room three, uh, community-based, uh, community-level community approaches, room four, or localization room five, select it, open the, the Zoom before you go on break because there is a limit. The limit, limit is not very low. I'm not gonna tell you how many it is. Um, it's pretty large each room, but if there are 50 of you that goes into one room, the room is gonna fill up and you won't be able to get in. So select your room before you leave. Um, and then take 10 minutes break. So at 15 minutes after the hour, we're going to come back to those rooms, not to this room anymore, to those five rooms where um, the leads are going to, to lead the discussion. 
we will see you guys very soon. Thank you, everyone.